morning. Welcome to the first lecture in the consortium's spring lecture series. Uh, the whole series on speaking science in public controversies. I'm Susan Wolf. I'm a professor of law, medicine, and public policy here at the University of Minnesota and faculty chair of the university's consortium on law and values in health, environment, and life sciences. Uh, I don't know about you, but I spent my early morning reading quickly about uh, the Wuhan coronavirus about discussion of climate change at Davos. I saw a CDC tweet on flu and the flu vaccine. So this topic could not be more important, could not be more current, uh, given what we are facing right now in the big world out there. Let me set the stage before I introduce my speakers, our speakers. Um, this lecture series is presented by the consortium, and I'd like to thank the planning committee. You know, we do things very democratically in the consortium, and that committee includes Amy Kircher, who is co-director of the university's Strategic Partnerships and Research Collaborative, Michael Osterholm, who is director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, SIDRAP, Michael Sadowski, who is director of the Biotechnology Institute, and Michael Georgiev, who is director of the Center for Neurobehavioral Development. I mean, as you can tell just from their centers, the consortium is a university-wide confederation of many centers and programs, 19 right now, that cross the entire breadth of this big university. And they're all united by the fact that they deal in one way or another with the societal implications of biomedicine and the life sciences. So the questions we're going to be engaging today about how do we talk about those implications, how do we talk about the underlying science, are front burner issues for all of the centers in the consortium. I want to thank the consortium staff for their wonderful management of all the complex logistics. We are simultaneously webcasting right now, so welcome to our webcast audience. We're thrilled that you're here too. And we're also videotaping so that we can put this up online for free public access, use it, share it, you know, teach with it. Uh, that's what we're trying to create. I want to also thank Alicia Cohen, who is here with us today up front. Uh, she is director of the Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communication here at the U for their contributions to this event. Our speaker today, as you know, is Professor Dietrich Scheufele. He is professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm going to introduce him a little bit more fully just in a second. And he's going to speak, as you know, uh, on from Alexa to CRISPR, making sense of controversial science in an age of polarized politics. He's going to talk for about 35, 40 minutes. Then I'm going to get up and introduce more briefly our wonderful faculty commentator, Professor Emily Vraga from the Hubbard School. And then she's going to talk for about seven to ten minutes, and then we're going to sit up here living room style, and the floor is open. You see there's a mic there, there's a mic there. Please come to the mic. Uh, it would be great if you introduce yourself just for a second so we begin to get to know each other. There's tremendous expertise and a real interdisciplinarity in this room, so it would be great if you just say who you are and where you're from. Uh, and those of you online, we absolutely want you part of this conversation. Um, the way you do it is simply to email us at consortm, that's the consortium, at umn.edu. So that's c-o-n-s-o-r-t-m at umn.edu. Ask your question. We're going to print it out, and it'll be run up to me as moderator uh, so that I can ask it. Because we are webcasting and recording, please silence your cell phones and all your devices right now. 
Uh, and if you need to exit the room midstream for any reason, if you could try to use the uh, doors at the back, that would be great because then you're not going to be so visible on the videotape and the webcast. Um, I want to give a special shout out and thank you to the high school students with us here today, including from Shattuck St. Mary's. We are completely thrilled that you're here and that you are modeling engagement with these issues from early in your careers. Whatever your career ends up being, whether it's in science or biomedicine or in communications or just as a citizen and a family member and a person who's active perhaps on social media, great that you're here. Uh, let me do a tiny bit of uh, housework here. Everybody in person here and on the webcast, you're all going to get an evaluation form. Please take the five minutes to fill it out. We and I read every single one. We really take your feedback seriously. We make changes based on your feedback. We want to know what you think. Um, people who are seeking continuing education credit, whether it's CLEs or CMEs or another form of continuing ed credits, those of you here in the room, you need to have registered at the front desk and we'll be sending you uh, online a participant tracker form, an evaluation form, you need to complete them. For those of us joining us through the webcast, um, you need to send an email now to consortm at umn.edu, just documenting that you have joined the webcast, and then you too are going to get those two forms online to complete. So that's the process for getting continuing ed credits. Um, other uh, healthcare or veterinary professionals seeking continuing education credit, you could submit a statement of participation to your accrediting organization or state board for consideration of credit. Disclosures. There are no relevant disclosures by the speakers or planning committee members and myself. A copy of the disclosure summary, if anybody would like to take a look at it, is available on the registration table. Okay, let me get to our speakers and what I'm going to do right now is introduce Professor Scheufele. Uh, we are really thrilled that he's able to be with us here today one of the country's leading thinkers in this entire area. He's the Taylor Bascom Chair in Science Communication and Vilas Distinguished Achievement Professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the Morgridge Institute for Research. His own research focuses on public attitudes and policy dynamics surrounding emerging science. You're going to hear more about that. Uh, he is really not only a, a leading researcher, but a leader in policy surrounding this. He's an elected member of the German National Academy of Science and Engineering. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS. Uh, the, he's also a fellow of the International Communication Association and the Wisconsin Academy of Sciences, Arts, and Letters. His consulting experience includes work for DeepMind, Porter Novelli, PBS, the World Health Organization, and the World Bank. And he does a lot at the National Academies, which is really how I first became acquainted with his work. He co-chairs the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine Standing Committee. So that's an ongoing effort on advancing science communication, research, and practice. And he also serves on the Academy's Division of Behavioral and Social Sciences and Educational Advisory Committee, Board of Health Sciences, and Division on Earth and Life Sciences Advisory Committee. And with that, please join me in welcoming Professor Scheufele. Well. Thank you so much, first of all, Susan, for this uh, uh, wonderful introduction. Thank you for, for having me. Thank you to all of you for coming and for listening in online. Um, and uh, I, I will talk about a, a, a number of issues uh, ranging from AI, Alexa, to CRISPR, new tools of, of human genome editing, um, all of which uh, 
have the potential or already have become controversial. A lot of the work that I'll be drawing on when I sometimes refer to we, I don't mean the royal we, I really mean a team of researchers and students at the University of Wisconsin who have contributed to this um, um, over time. I do want to go through three or four uh, themes uh, more broadly. So one, I want to make the argument, and, and we can discuss this later, that we're in a, in a unique spot in where science is in this country. Um, and and that, that raises issues, challenges, but also opportunities that are different from what we've seen before. Um, I want to highlight three things in particular, um, and I know that the, the high school students were asked to watch some talks of me before online, so you'll see some uh, repetition, I'm sure, in the arguments that I'm presenting, um, but that have, that have made things worse or that have co complicated things. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. One is who we are as human beings and how we behave. Um, the second one is that we're in an environment that is not, sometimes it's referred to as a new information environment, as if we've reached a new, a new status quo, and that's, of course, not true. We're in the middle of a rapid transformation, and we don't know where that transformation of our inf information environment is going to end. Um, and then I want to put the spotlight a little bit on the scientific community um, because, of course, we are very good at, at pointing out problems with society at large and how it responds to the scientific enterprise. Uh, but, but sometimes, at least, we're, we're also part of the problem. And I want to at least put that out as an argument and then leave you with a few thoughts on, on, on how I think we should, we should move forward um, or could move forward maybe better. Um, this is, this is a, a, a picture that I've shown elsewhere before, um, but I like this picture for a variety of reasons. It's the UW-Madison campus, and it's the ag side of campus. So this is in the mid-19th century, um, and, uh, and, it, and the reason why this picture is up there is because it, it, it references the idea of land-grant universities. The idea that if you read congressional speeches leading up to the Morrill Act, um, they talk about teaching farmers to grow two blades of grass instead of one. So to not just do the research, but do the research in a way that really directly benefits um, the state and beyond, and, and Minnesota and Wisconsin as land grants are not any different from Berkeley uh, and, 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 and Davis and, and all the other land grants uh, and, and A&Ms across the country. The tricky part, of course, is um, that that translational work and that connection to various publics hasn't always worked out the way it, 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 it should be. This is, for example, data uh, from the Pew Foundation uh, where they're asking the, the, the general public, meaning all of us, um, if they think that scientists have generally come to an agreement of issues ranging from the Big Bang to climate change um, to evolution. So these are all areas of settled science. Um, but as you can see from the dark blue, scientists are divided to the lighter blue people thinking that scientists generally agree. You see that there are good chunks among the general public, among all of us, who believe that the science is not settled on issues as fundamental as the Big Bang and others. So clearly there are gaps, and, and I'm not telling you anything that's new. I just want to, to highlight how far we are even in 2020, and these data are clearly not 2020 data, a little bit older, but even in 2020, from where the ideal was when in the height of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln um, and Congress created um, the idea of the land grants. So part of the problem with all of this, and, and, and we talked about this at dinner a little bit last night, um, but I think all of us intuitively believe um, what we in the social sciences and certainly in communication, science communication, call the knowledge deficit model. It's a model that fundamentally deserves to be true. It should be true. Um, and that's the idea that, that if we just put more information out there, if we explain to the public why what we do matters and what it's all about and what the science is behind it, they will end up thinking about the science. Non-experts will think about the science the same way that we do. They will be more supportive of the scientific enterprise and so on and so forth. Um, and I put Neil deGrasse Tyson here um, for two reasons. A, because, of course, he ultimately has built his career in that very model. And B, he also personifies that mic drop that usually comes at the end, meaning now we've told you everything there is to know. Now you buy into the science. Mic drop. We're done. Um, and I want to show you over the next um, um, 30 or so minutes why that not only doesn't work, but sometimes is utterly dysfunctional. Um, a... And, and I think there's two problems with that, just to give you a, a quick teaser. One is that it, it, it actually is utterly unscientific um, because it 
There's no scientific evidence that the knowledge deficit model actually works. In fact, there's a lot of scientific evidence that it doesn't work, um, and I'll show you some of that. But number two is it also assumes that science is only based on facts. And, and the consortium, at the, the very idea, as I understand it, of consortium is the idea of controversial science. It doesn't become controversial. Sometimes it becomes controversial because of the facts surrounding it. But very often it becomes controversial because it's at odds with values that, that are all very close to our heart. Um, embryonic stem cell research, editing the human germline, AI and replacing human decision making. Um, and those are things that science can make a contribution to but certainly can't answer definitively. So the model both normatively and empirically um, doesn't hold. Um, so just to highlight the idea of, of, of why emerging science, and I told you earlier, I'm going to make the argument that we're in a new era of science, that science, that, that the types of application that science right now is putting in front of us as a society or as societies um, is fundamentally different um, from what we've seen before. We're very good at managing a lot of the technical risks, better than we have been in the past, anticipating life cycle developments and so on and so forth. Um, but a lot of modern science also raises questions that are at the very core of what the consortium does around the ethics, around the morality, around the political implications of things like climate change, for instance. And I just want to highlight three things that they all have in, in common. Number one is they arrive more quickly than we can think them through as a society. We had these discussions when nano first came, nanotechnology first came along, so modifications at the molecular level, and, and ethicists wrote that you know it's not any given choice that we're making that's complicated, it's there's so many of these choices that are coming our way that we don't have the infrastructure. What I put here is, um, and there's multiple software packages that do this now um, that allow police departments in Chicago and LA and London all over the world to preemptively police, to monitor social media traffic location data from mobile devices, and basically predict the likelihood of you committing a crime based on who you're connected to and what their behaviors and their, their criminal record is and their current ongoing real-time behavior. Um, raises huge issues, of course, um, for what's kind of, what kinds of policing we do, who is going to be targeted by, by that, um, and so on. Um, but it is already in effect. They're being used all over the country. We haven't had a conversation as a country if we want to use that, um, what the implications might be, what the implications might be for minority populations, and so on and so forth. Number two, um, a lot of these new areas of science fundamentally challenge um, value systems. Questions like, what does it mean to be human? This is an embryo, um, a chimeric embryo developed at the Salk Institute out in California, a pig embryo um, with, with a genetic marker turned off and injected with human stem cells to grow tailored organs for organ transplants. So the benefits are obvious. Um, we, we, one of us needs a transplant. This is a transplant that, is, that, that at some point will be less likely or, or very unlikely to be rejected by the body um, and, and will, uh, much, uh, will require much, much less vigorous drug regimens and so on and so forth. But it is a, a chimeric embryo that brings together human organs within a pig embryo. Um, at the most basic level, what happens to Muslim populations who may not be able to accept a, a, an organ grown in a, in a, in a pig embryo? Um, or what, is it, what happens when we grow a human brain, for instance, in a pig? Um, does that all of a sudden give that animal consciousness and so on and so forth? And some of these may seem outlandish, but you can see how there is a, a wide variety of ethical questions, all of which we don't at first glance have a really good answer to. And then the last one, and this is one that's not new, but I, I, I still want to highlight it, uh, self-driving cars. Uh, we've, we've now spent decades trying to teach AI tools and neural networks um, the ability to make moral choices. Um, and we've gotten pretty good at it. Um, we've, we're teaching um, uh, neural networks and, and AI to, to recognize um, uh, road signs, and we've gotten pretty good at it. Um, this is uh, work out of Stanford and, and, and Carnegie Mellon. This is a stop sign, um, as all of us in this room, um, even people who are colorblind or otherwise um, visually impaired would see this as a stop sign. Most neural networks in self-driving cars see, see this as a 45 mile an hour sign. And it, they see that because it has a, a few white and black stripes of tape attached to it. Um, to be fair, it took the team that did that a long time to do it, to find out exactly where to put them, how thick they had to be in order to, 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 to mess with the neural networks, but it's possible. 
And you can see how that creates some huge issues. And you can see why we're at some point, not at some point, we're, we're, we're currently, um, uh, you know, when we, when we get into self-driving cars, those cars are in a very narrow set of circumstances um, programmed to kill us because that will be the moral choice. The best moral choice will be to, to kill the driver rather than running over people on the sidewalk or rather than spinning out of control and crashing into three or four other cars. The most moral choice may be to kill the driver. Um, again, something that will be a whole new concept as parents purchase cars for their children that take them to soccer practice. And again, we're, we're you know, it, 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 there's an initial chuckle, but if you think it through, um, it is a, it is a, a, a non-trivial um, 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 ethical conundrum. Um, as Susan pointed out to me at dinner yesterday, the, I, I used a, a very young picture of Alan Leshner here, um, and I'm really hoping he's not listening in, otherwise he's going to yell at me the next time he sees me. Um, I think Alan Leshner still looks exactly like this. Um, Alan Leshner said in the early 2000s something that was very, that, that showed a lot of foresight and insight into how the, the scientific community works. And he basically said, because of all of this, we need to stop as scientists to engage in this knowledge deficit. Let, let us tell you what you should think, but instead engage in an honest bi-directional dialogue. And he included a second part that's often left out when people talk about the, the idea of engaging with different publics. He said, it's not just a dialogue about why science is great. It's a dialogue about what the risks and the perils and the pitfalls are. And we need to have an honest dialogue, especially for this new type of, of science. So I've set up the problem. I've set up where we may have kind of misstepped is the wrong word, but maybe missed some opportunities. And I think the urgency of that is, 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 is uh, on display right now for, for three reasons. And one is us, all of us, every single person in this room. So I'm not talking about a non-expert public here. I'm talking about us. When we make choices about science or about anything in this world, we engage in what's known as motivated reasoning. Um, and that is really, really important for science. It happens in politics all the time. If you, if you watched late last night into the impeachment hearings like I did, um, you, you, depending on what your politics were, you saw different things, even though you watched the same television feed. Uh, and we know from political psychology, and we've known this for a long time, um, that all of us engage in confirmation and disconfirmation biases. Um, you've heard that term. Many of you have heard that term before. It doesn't mean, it does not mean that we select just the science or the facts that fit our prior beliefs. What it means, and this is why it's much more pernicious than just selective perception, what it means is if we have 10 facts in front of us, or five, that we all agree, this whole room agrees that those are true facts. I understand that that's somewhat redundant. That those are facts. Um, all of us will still weigh more heavily those facts that fit our prior beliefs and will weigh less heavily disconfirmation biases, the facts that don't fit. Um, and we do that, and this is where the second bullet point here, bias assimilation, is really important. We assimilate reality into our belief system, not the other way around. Right? You would assume democratically what happens is that I take new facts and I adjust my belief systems. I now have new information. I'm now changing what I hold to be true. Instead, what we're doing, we're taking reality and we're weighing that reality more heavily that fits our prior beliefs and we're weighing less heavily those facts that don't fit our prior beliefs. And we do that largely um, to, to protect our political, our religious, our value-based identities. It's a simplistic view of how the world works. There's, there's more complexity to it, and very often it's not just about identity protection. Jamie Druckmann, um, who used to be on the faculty here uh, in political science, has written about this quite powerfully recently, but the, the general phenomenon is unfortunately very much in effect. For politics, and last night maybe for the impeachment hearings and today, that's not as surprising. But for science, um, it is... It is important because it simply me it basically means that the same facts mean different things to different people. And I want to come back really quickly to those two pictures, um, especially since this is an issue that's important to the consortium as well. Um, on the left, you see Bush 40, George Bush 43, um, uh, with a snowflake baby. So this is a baby 
um, that has come uh, out of, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fertilized embryo from in vitro fertilization that under a program under the Bush administration, parents could adopt and carry to term. Um, it's called a snowflake baby because the argument is that, look, every single one of these fertilized embryos, or fertilized eggs, rather, is, um, is, is, is unique as a snowflake, and, and here's the choice you're making if you support embryonic stem cell research. Again, I'm not embracing this argument. I'm just giving you the general line of argument saying, look, this could be a baby, or you could do research on this um, for embryonic stem cell research, and Michael J. Fox, of course, being one of those. Just to highlight how the same facts end up uh, potentially meaning very different things to different people. Wisconsin being a, a, a self-respecting, very liberal university, of course, engages in a lot of motivated reasoning. I'm saying this with um, the, the appropriate amount of self-criticism um, um, that, that you know, we as academics sometimes um, could use more of. Um, uh, governor Walker, Scott Walker, who, former Governor Walker now, at some point took $300 million from the university um, and moved it uh, to build a, a stadium for the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, and there was a big outcry within the UW system, of course, because some of that money also came uh, in the form of matching money that had been, that had been going to support ongoing uh, USDA, um, um, Department of Energy, and, and, and other grants um, on biofuels. And so a lot of people said, how does he not understand how this undermines the economic well-being of the state, that this kind of research is going to push the frontier and, and economic impacts on the state? Well, motivated reasoning. Um, we happen to have a, a, research, a, a, a survey in the field for the Corn Growers Association at the time. Uh, what we looked at, at the, on the x-axis, you see basically a, a, a high and low information intake. Um, so this is controlling out for partisanship for everything else, uh, for gender, for, for age, for all the, the demographics, and so on. And then the y-axis, you see a, a net positive perceived effect on the economy. So did people think that there was a positive effect of biofuels research? or a negative one below zero. So what happens is Democrats are getting more information. Um, the more information they get, the more positive they turn on, on biofuels, the more they learn. And it doesn't really matter where they get that from. Um, it produces a positive effect. For Republicans, it does the exact opposite. So what is go what's going on there? Um, and, and I think two things are really important. One is polarization is strongest among the most well-informed which seems totally counterintuitive, but a lot of research has shown exactly that. We're not the only ones. Uh, polarization ends up um, strongest among those who know most about an issue or who have the, at least the, 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 the most information intake. And number two takeaway here, neither one of those groups is right. They just basically take the exact same information and, and filter it through slightly different priors, values, um, ideologies, and so on. So one of the things that we've tried to do um, is figure out what, what happens if we, if we try to counter some of that, um, or if there is a spokesperson, that's very often the argument, who can speak to certain value-based communities. And we had a nice um, uh, field experiment is the wrong word here, but a, 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 a nice naturally occurring experiment when Pope Francis came to the U.S. And Pope Francis had just released uh, before that um, uh, uh, the encyclical on, on climate change where he, where he said very explicitly there is a scientific consensus, climate change is real, it's man-made, and we need to do something about it. The science is settled. Um, and that just doesn't come from the Pope all that often. So we having the Pope coming to the U.S. to a highly polarized um, environment, uh, speaking to climate change, and saying it's real, and, it's, and, and we need to do something about it. Um, so we wanted to know, is, is this helping? Right? Is this actually doing what... what, um, what uh, we were hoping to do, and that is that it would moderate some of the the, the partisan gaps between uh, liberals and, and conservatives. And you see here on the left, um, people who are very liberal, on the right, who, people who are very conservative. And then you have two, basically, graphs with error bars. Um, either, uh, the, the red ones are people who are largely unaware of the encyclical, and the black ones, the ones who are aware. What we were hoping is that as people became aware of the encyclical, the difference between liberals and conservatives would go away because the pope speaks as a, as a moral figure to both. But the exact opposite happened. Meaning, when people heard from the Pope that climate change is real and it was man-made and we had to do something about it, they dug in and became even more polarized in their political views. And that was true for Catholics and it was new, true for non-Catholics. So what's going on there? This should be the exact opposite, right? This is we're giving you a value-based, or the Pope is giving you a value-based out that says you can actually adjust your, your viewpoints um, without necessarily challenging, I said earlier, this is about identity protection. Well, this is what happened. 
Uh, we also asked if the Pope is a credible messenger um, on the y-axis now. So this is again the same graph except for is the Pope a credible messenger. And again you have the, the, the unaware in red and you have the, the aware people who had read the encyclical in black. And basically what people, and this is Catholics again who read the encyclical did, they basically said the Pope is not a credible messenger on this topic. So rather than changing their view on climate change, they changed their view on the Pope in order to not have to, uh, to agree with the political um, um, issue or with what they saw as a, as a politicized scientific issue. Um, and the same thing is true for non-Catholics. So the idea is we, we would rather change our view on the leader of a church and on, on a, on a, on a faith-based uh, faith leader than we would on a highly politicized um, scientific issue. So all of that, unfortunately, is exacerbated by and put on steroids, steroids maybe, um, by our, our rapidly changing information environment. And I just want to highlight a few things that, that many of you know. Um, but one is we've, we've changed for a long time. This is just a recent study that came out on this. Um, but for a long time now, we've switched to a model where editorial choices are not or are increasingly not made by human editors, but by, uh, by ongoing A-B testing. The Washington Post, when they put an article out, they put the article out, five different headlines, five different slightly tweaked leads. Uh, within 15 minutes, it gets randomly assigned. You click on this from a, a link that your friends send you that's on Facebook, or you go to the website, you get a random version of those five. Within 15 minutes, they know how quickly this has gone through Twitter, um, what, the, what the footprint is on social, um, how much engagement there is in terms of times of reading. And after 15 minutes, that story is the one that they're going with. You can sometimes see this when you Google a story, somebody tells you a title to a story, you Google it and you get a slightly different result with a slightly different headline. That's when you get the A-B test and the link that was sent to you is actually the old link. Um, but what that means is we're now getting more and more news that are more popular or that, are, that do well on social um, then we get news that necessarily an editor, that an editor would think we should, we should look at. Um, that tailoring and what we call micro-targeting, so rather than, or narrow casting, so it used to be broadcasting, right? We sent news out, a, a few newscasters to all of America. Now we're talking about narrow casting. We take all the available news and tailor it toward the specific needs of, and, and, and desires of somebody who has clicked on XYZ on their iPad rather than somebody else. Facebook. Twitter, uh, Google searches, all have curated timelines or search results, meaning none of us get the exact same results. We all get tailored results based on where we are, what hardware we use, uh, what engagement with what other users we've had, what our social networks look like, what our friends do, and so on and so forth. And democratically, that has, a, has huge implications in terms of us filtering out things we don't like. We just heard we even will adjust our views on the Pope in order to not have to change our views. Now we're getting news that is tailored increasingly toward our preferences. Um, and this is not going to go any better, uh, not going to get any better. And I, I, better is the wrong word here, because I think it's just a change that is occurring if we like it or not. Uh, this is the most recent data from the Oxford Reuters Internet Institute, uh, who worldwide look at, at media use patterns. Um, and they, they, uh, they, this year, for the first time, they broke it into this, what I think is a really good graph. Um, for those of us in the room who are over 35, the depressing news is that 35 and plus is now the old group. Um, so this is the, these are the people in the red. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but the interesting thing is if you look from the right to the left, you basically have all, uh, all um, non-algorithmic, so traditional delivery on the right. You have direct, you go straight to the website, alerts that you set up that show up on your phone from the New York Times, news aggregators, um, Apple News, whatever, Feedly. And then you go over to algorithmic. Instagram, which belongs to Facebook, of course, Twitter, Facebook, and other types of social media. So all things that, are, that have tailored feeds. And you can see that the blue bars are getting longer as we go over to algorithmic, and the, the, the red bars are longer as we go over to traditional. In other words, the users of traditional news are literally dying out. Um, it's going to go away. Um, and we are moving toward a model where, where algorithmically delivered news and tailored news um, is going to be the new normal. Um, people speak about this quite openly in the journalistic profession. If you talk to uh, people like Jim Vandehei, who runs Axios, who ran Politico before, who wrote for The Post before, basically says, look, we're not going to produce content anymore. It doesn't make economic sense. That, that is not tailored toward the specific um, desires of the audience, and we, we do not have the bandwidth anymore to produce content that will not have an audience um, in commercial news. Okay. So we talked about a new information environment. The last thing I want to talk about is how we sometimes feed the beast, and we do. 
Um, and we can have a conversation about this later on about why that is or, or what the problem is, but I do want to show you just a few tweets uh, from very prominent scientists. This is Michael Mann, a climate scientist at Penn State, who a couple of years ago won the engagement award from AAAS um, for um, um, outstanding work in public engagement. He routinely tweets that everybody with an R next to their name, everybody who's a Republican should not be in Congress, uh, that Republicans are just wrong in everything. Um, again, one can have that view, but if we're talking about reaching an audience that we want to reach on climate change and convince them that climate change is real and we should do something about it, calling them unfit for office may not be the best opener. Um, and this is, uh, I would say, first week of Communication 101. Um, Richard Dawkins, of course, who is, who is uh, everybody who's religious, uh, believes in a spaghetti monster, but also often takes shots at people who have... Uh, religious moral ethical concerns about embryonic research and, and again uh, one might not share those concerns uh, depending on what one's viewpoint or faith is but again that conversation needs to take place if we like it or not and that conversation is not just an embryonic stem cell conversation it's a CRISPR conversation and it's a, 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 a tissue engineering conversation and one that that will come up again and again. The last one is a, a little bit more subtle um, and this is Neil deGrasse Tyson again um, who put this tweet up um, on December 25th, um, I believe, um, yep, uh, saying, on this day uh, long ago, a child was born who by the age of 30 would transform the world. Happy birthday, Isaac Newton. Um, funny, very funny, um, except for trolling Christians on Christmas, on Christmas Day is, again, not the way for me to say my values align with you and we should have a conversation. It says I have values that are very different from you. You're sitting right now here um, celebrating um, a, an important religious holiday, and I'm basically saying, you know, the really important person who was born today is a scientist um, and not, not Jesus Christ. So let me show, show you why that is, why where scientists stand sometimes can be a problem. This is data that Matt Nisbet has put together, who's now at Northeastern. This is when he was still at American. Um, he basically took a whole bunch of surveys and combined them along ideology and partisanship, so either registered partisanship or then your general view on political issues. Um, and you have Democrat, Republican on the Y, and you have uh, liberal and conservative on the, on the, um, on the X. Um, this is where AAAS members are. Um, so AAAS members are, are members of one of the largest generalist uh, scientific organizations, and not just scientists that's often misrepresented, um, they're, 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 but they're clearly a science-friendly audience. They're sitting all the way down on the left left. Right? In fact, they're sitting, if you look at the two axes, as far left as Tea Party members, Mormon Church members, Fox News viewers, and evangelicals sit on the right. So they're, they're actually equally f uh, far away or at, at equidistant from where the two axes meet. But most importantly, this is where the general public is, right, and where the general public sits. In a, in a, in a, in a more moderate view, right between, um, but we're pretty far away from them. And all the three tweets, and those three tweets are not exceptions. Um, I, I think, and that's, a, that's an overstatement. I shouldn't say it that way. I think there are exceptions, but they're not atypical. Um, there's definitely more of them out there. Um, and they don't help us, especially from highly prominent scientists, to connect with, with those audiences. So let me just um, end with a few paths forward, because I think there are a lot of people, especially in the scientific community, but elsewhere as well, who who, who really care about these things. I've, I've talked a lot about knowledge and about science and, 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 and how to communicate it or about it. Um, but I think one of the things, and I know a lot of people here are from the health field, I, I do not want to leave you with the impression, and, and I, I know many of you know a lot about this anyway, um, that, that shortcuts or that, our, that, that not using information is always a, a bad thing. In fact, very often, Good communication is, is just about playing to all the biases that we have. Um, this is, for instance, um, a, a, a mailer that many of you have gotten about where you are relative to your neighbors and, and your voting record. Um, and so this, how do you compare to others? And the idea is a social norms approach, right? If I know that my neighbors vote and I don't, um, I'm going to go out and vote. That, there's no rational reason to this. It's simply that I don't want to look worse than my neighbors. And the only reason I'm showing you this mailer that I got is because now I do better than my neighbors. I didn't used to. So I would have never put this up you know, five years ago, but now I'm putting it up um, to show you that. Um, another really successful piece of communication, and, and um, I, I'm assuming some of you will relate to this more than others. Um, um, this is 
um, in Santa Monica somewhere, but Amsterdam has them as well. I'll blow it up so you know what I'm talking about, is that little engraved thing there. Um, and if you don't know why that's there, um, you're not alone. That's there to, to because males and their decision making are somewhat more simplistic. And this spot is what minimizes splashage when you pee on that. Right? So I'm basically getting you to do the, the thing that I want you to do without any single piece of information. I'm not telling you anything. I'm not explaining to you the fluid mechanics that went into how that urinal was constructed or where that spot is. All I'm doing is I'm engraving a, a, a shell or an Amsterdam. It's a fly or whatever else. So a lot of really good science communication actually uses our biases and uses them very successfully. And in health communication, we do this all the time as well. Um, and that's not a bad thing. That's, that's in fact just, you know, the, people call it nudging now in behavioral economics, but, but it's been around for, for a long time in, 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 in fields like science communication, health communication. Um, the second one, I think, is we need to realize that um, I think events like this, I think events like, like Science on Tap and others are really important events, um, but they still have a built-in assumption that, that people come to where the science is. Um, and, and I would make an argument that, that a little bit we need to move where people are. Um, where did people first find out about nanotechnology? I mentioned this earlier. Molecular modifications or modifications at the molecular level, one to 100 nanometers with a nanometer being a billionth of a meter. Um, they didn't hear about it from the Washington Post or from the New York Times or, or from Nova Science. Um, they, they saw Terminator. Um, <laughs> And that's where the first mention of nanotechnology came along. I had a student who did a master's thesis where she went through all the comic books uh, that were out there to see where, where, where nano was first mentioned. Uh, when, come, when it comes to the, to the, 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 the downsides and the and societal implications of, of cloning and, and gene editing Orphan Black, um, even Luke Cage, while well, he's canceled, but before he was canceled, he was CRISPR edited. Um, designated survivor, terrorists used CRISPR to, to, for, to, to distribute pathogens in, in, uh, among the U.S. population. And then, of course, we've all seen Sheldon Cooper. None of us have ever seen a, 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 a theoretical physicist at work, but we've seen Sheldon Cooper and we've seen Doc from Back to the Future. Why am I mentioning this? Because it's actually a really important tool for, for connecting with, with general audiences. And I should um, not put this up just yet because it gives away the punchline. But in my class, so I teach a large undergrad course in science, media, and society, and I basically ask them uh, to give me um, five terms. This is an attendance quiz that they have to fill out, so they all get on their phones. They, and I ask them, give me five terms that for you to find a scientist. And then they all fill them out, and they go home, and I come back the next class, and I show them this word cloud of what a scientist looks like. <laughs> These are students from five different colleges who work with scientists on a daily basis at the University of Wisconsin. This is what they walk away from. Um, white lab coat, glasses, older hair, smart goggles, crazy hair, and so on and so forth. It's the, it also always has, this is the bizarre thing, kind of there's some European foreigner yellow teeth in there, so that's a little bit troubling for me. But in general, this is what comes out. And then, of course, they say, well, that's not true. right? This is, this is just how the way you set it up. And I'm like, well, this is last year's. And that was the year before. And that was the year before that. <laughs> Every year, it happens the exact same way. And these are students who are at, at an R1 university who work with scientists routinely and the strongest influence is what we in communication call cultivation, meaning media cultivate a perception of what is normal and how things are that we cannot observe in reality. This has been a theory and a model that's been around since the 70s. Um, and that model, just to end up on a, on a more optimistic note here, can also be used in a very positive way. Barbara Klein Pope, who is on the right here, um, who was for 35 years a communications director for the National Academies, who is now running the, the Johns Hopkins University Press, um, created a, or helped create a, a program for the National Academies in DC, um, what they call the Science and Entertainment Exchange. And what they do is they want to use the exact same mechanisms that make my students think that scientists are, uh, have white hair and are crazy and, and goggles and, 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 and so on. How can we flip that around? And so for Thor, which is a, a movie that Natalie Portman starred in um, based on a Marvel adaptation, I think it's Marvel, um, they worked with, with Kenneth Branagh and said, look, um, in the original comic book, this is what Natalie Portman's role looked like. Um, there were a bunch of scientists, and then there's a nurse, and, and you know, she's kind of working in science, but the real scientists are all males. I think you can already see where this is going in terms of STEM pipelines and, and gender disparities in, in, in STEM fields. And, and Barbara said, you can't do this. You need to, you need to change this. And, and they changed the script of Thor. And, and for those of you who have seen the movie, Natalie Portman, Portman became a physicist. And this is actually what the movie poster, um, or one of the movie posters look like. The woman of science, Thor. 
right? And so the exact same constant portrayals that have produced some of the misperceptions um, related to gender and others um, that have been problematic, we can also hopefully use to, to counter some of the exact same um, problems that we're, that we're having in, in, in science communication. So there may be some really unorth unorthodox tools that allow us to take science, and especially messages about science, about recruitment into STEM fields, STEM fields and so on, um, to, to audiences where they are rather than where we are. Um, the, the last thing I want to end on is, is, or the thing I want to end on is, is, is can we return to what I would call productive disagreement? Uh, the reason why I'm putting this last is because I think we will disagree. Um, all the issues that I outlined earlier, um, should we edit the human germline um, moving forward in ways that is, again, that is redundant, but that's heritable just to get that point across. Um, should we do that? There is no real factual true answer to that. There's a political answer to that. There's a moral answer to that. And depending on where your value systems are, you will fall on different, um, on different spots in, in a continuum or different points in a continuum. Um, so we will have to disagree. And we'll have to disagree in a way that allows us to move forward. Move forward in an environment that looks like this. Um, this, again, brings us right back to impeachment. This is 1994, um, two years into the Clinton presidency. Um, uh, Republican revolution in the House, um, and look, we're still pretty close together. This is the American electorate. You can still campaign toward the Purple Middle. 2004, George Bush 43 runs for re-election, um, having started a couple wars. Nobody thinks, few people think at the time those are great wars, um, if you look at public opinion polls. Uh, but he turns out 9 million people in Florida, Ohio, and elsewhere, convincing them that a culture war is going on, even in that time period we're still pretty close together and you can campaign toward the middle. Um, this is where we are now a year or that where we were a year into the, the Trump presidency. This is not a conservative or a liberal problem. This is both. Um, both have moved significantly further to the left. I think we're seeing this right now in the, in the Democratic primaries and we're seeing it in, in some of the behavior of the, of the Republicans. There's, it's not a partisan issue in the sense that it's one party and not the other. It's a partisan issue in the sense that it's both parties. So one of the things that we were trying to do, and this is an NSF grant that my colleagues, Dominique Broussard on the left, and Mike Zinos, who's in communication arts at Wisconsin, and, um, uh, who's, who's, who's a political scientist by training, have started, um, this is an NSF project, to depolarize debates from the get-go. Can we create forms of public engagement around issues like, and in this case, human genome editing, that, that take values into account, but, but don't end up in a spot where those values basically polarize people and push them into different camps in a way that they don't talk to each other anymore. And I just want to show you some data really quickly. This is uh, preliminary data um, of how, again, some of our biases work in our favor if we just use them right. Um, what we do in, in surveys or in experiments, rather, so there's a lab experiment with UW-Madison students. Uh, we basically tell them, hey, uh, we're going to ask you a bunch of questions about this, this technology, and you can look at other information. Afterwards, you're going to have to talk to other people. We're going to assign you to discussion groups where you have to engage on the topic with others. And the discussion groups are either defined on the very right as no discussion group, not the very right, this is the this is summative, but the no discussion group, or discussion with people that are like you, similar others, that are unlike you, so people who will disagree with you, opposing others, and then unknown others. We just don't tell them what they look like. We just tell you, tell them they have to discuss. And then we let them go into what's called a gated information environment. They can go out online, but they actually don't know, but it's restricted, so they can only go to a certain set of, of articles. They'll know when they try to get out of it. But so they basically have three groups of articles, general news, um, science and medicine, so factual information. And then the last one is editorials and opinions that, that force them to look at the, or allow them to look at the other side, meaning they see both sides of the issue. And then we track where they go first. We don't care what they do in the discussion. The discussion is only a threat. We're basically telling them, hey, you may be exposed to viewpoints different from your other. You can't live in your red or your blue bubble. You will have to talk to people from the other side. In all the conditions where we force them to talk, the going to this two-sided information is higher than in the no-talk condition. So just the threat of having to engage with other people basically makes us break out of our, our, our information diet and, says, um, and, and makes us more likely to look at information from the other side. But the number, of course, is highest, or not of course, but beautifully, is highest for talking to people that are, that are unlike us. Meaning if I know I have to be discussing things with people that disagree with me, 
I will be much more likely to look at arguments from both sides, not engage in motivated reasoning as much, and so on and so forth. Um, and again, is that, is that democratically, it's, it's normatively ideal. That's exactly what we want to have. We talk across lines of difference, and we engage in, 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 in information seeking that fits there. Um, of course, from a, from a, from a, 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 a scalability perspective, um, that's the next question. How do we actually implement that in an in a environment that's highly polarized the way I just described to you? So um, last thing that I want to highlight for you are, are two efforts that are, or one effort that's ongoing right now, and I think I'll end on that. Um, and that is a, an effort um, that a lot of philanthropies, and I, I, I didn't put all of them on here, um, together, but uh, the Rita Allen Foundation has been leading this effort, and Elizabeth Christofferson in New Jersey, who has brought together people from Burris Welcome, Moore, um, Chen Zuckerberg, all over the place to create what they call the civic science imperative, and what Elizabeth um, and, uh, and Brooke Smith and I, in, a, in an article for the, social, uh, for the Stanford Social Innovation Review, called the civic science imperative. Uh, can we train the next generation of folks who are going to work at the interface of news and, and journalism, of science, the bench science, and of the social science that, that helps us understand how they interface um, and create the next generation of leaders that will go off into foundations, that will go off into politics, that will go off into science, and that will change the culture in a way where we are able to answer those, 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 broader, those broader questions. The, uh, the, the one last, if I have slide for time for one more slide that I'll show you here, um, this is what the timeline has looked like. On the, this is what I started out with, knowledge deficit models. It's really communication of science to the public. We know what's true. We tell them they accept it. Um, and I've told you what the problems with those are, with that are both, or with that model are, both normatively and empirically. We've shifted to those engagement models where we said, look, we need to engage with the broader public, um, not just tell them what the science is, but talk about the, the benefits and the pitfalls. And that got us closer, but this is where we really are on the right. A lot of these questions that we're going to tackle, CRISPR, um, AI, will not have exclusively scientific answers. They will not have answers that science by itself can't answer. We, that doesn't mean that we don't need the best available science to guide public discussions, but if we're going to move ahead with editing the human germline, will not exclusively be answered by science. It will have to be answered by questions that involve ethics, politics, morals, and, and, and science will just be one big piece of the puzzle. And I think this is where we are, and this is why this is such an urgent problem, and this is why I really appreciate you coming out and, and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dietram. Next up is, for our faculty comment, Professor Emily Varaga, I'm just going to briefly introduce her. She's an associate professor here in the Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communication, where she holds the Don and Carol Larson Professorship in Health Communication. And her own research focuses on how individuals process news and information about contentious health, scientific, and political issues, particularly in response to disagreeable messages they encounter in the digital media environment. Professor Vraga. Right. Thank you. Um, and thank you to Professor Schoifula. That was a fantastic lecture. I feel like I've learned a lot and importantly forces us to think about what to do next. And we spent a little bit of time on that and that's where I want to spend the most of my time is thinking about what can we do? What can we do as scientists? What can we do as educators? And what can we do as citizens to make sure that we're participating in a society that values science and responds to science the ways that we want it to do? Now, Dr. Schäufele talked about two of the big challenges to that, our own human nature and the changing media environment. I think those same things represent opportunities to us, especially when we think about social media. We saw that young people increasingly, but us old people as well, are going to social media for a lot of our news and information and including for some of our science potentially. I think it's a a uh, particularly fruitful area for a couple reasons. One, scientists are already there. We know that if we talk about our research, it tends to work better for us among the scientific community. In other words, we're doing a really good job of speaking to other academics, of speaking within the academy. In fact, 
Professor Schäufele's work has shown, if you tweet about your research, you'll get more citations. Fantastic. But that's still limited in that we're talking to other people just like us. We need to go beyond and make sure we're talking to the public about not just the stuff that we do, not just the work we produce, I have a new study showing X and Y and Z, but the actual scientific process itself. It's disappointing that students in our classrooms think of scientists as wearing lab coats and glasses. Some of those are true, right? If you look around, there's a lot of glasses in this room. But making sure that they know, yes, we're scientists as well. Something like 81% of people can't name a living scientist. A recent study suggested that. But they probably know them. And making sure that they know that they know them is a place where social media can help. Not just, here's what I found, but here's what I'm doing. Here are the questions that fascinate me. Here's the process by which I need to go through to answer those questions. Making science a little bit less opaque, inviting the community in, is only going to make science communication better. Another way we need to engage with social media as scientists is to help make sure people do have the right information. Motivated reasoning is real, but it can be overcome. Attitudes on climate change are moving at an incredibly rapid pace in the last few years. The number of alarmed people about climate change is going up. We might have to adapt reality to fit our worldview, but at some point reality comes knocking on the door. We can help make that happen. My own research has suggested that if you engage in what we call observational correction, in other words, if you see somebody sharing misinformation on scientific topics, on health topics, and you provide accurate information, expert information, or point out the, the logical fallacies in the misinformation, you leave the community watching that interaction in a better place than they were. Because it's important to recognize that on social media, every interaction is about a community. It's the person sharing the information, it's the people responding, but it's also everyone else seeing that message. Motivated reasoning can be higher or lower. So if I'm the kind of person who's sharing misinformation on social media, who is saying climate change is not real, I'm going to be pretty hard to convince because I go in ready to, to defend my position, to do battle. Everyone else who's on social media just to see cute kid pictures and, and find out um, what shows are playing this weekend and see fantastic um, photographs is not ready, is not prepared to have that debate and potentially are more open to those types of corrective messages. So if you see something, say something. And that's true for scientists and that's true for the public as well. Scientists, of course, need to do this in two ways. First, by doing it directly, by responding when they see misinformation, but also by making sure that our science is not gated. It's easily shared, easily accessed, easily understood, so that as every one of you goes out and makes the information environment a better place, you have the tools at your disposal. It's our job as scientists to make sure you have them and that they're ready to be used. So as you can see, I'm not just, yes, scientists need to do a lot. I'm certainly not going to point to anyone else, but the public as well has a role to play. And social media is a place where it's easy to play that role. One of Professor Schäufele's last slides showed that when we think we're going to have to talk to people who disagree, we change our information habits. We are more willing to at least seek out and see what the other side is saying. And hearing the other side often leads to tolerance and knowledge. So yes, social media is dominated by algorithms. That can prevent present a problem, but that can also present a solution because it ultimately gives the power to each and every one of us. We have the power to say, algorithm, this is what I would like to see. If you start clicking on high credibility headlines, they'll start showing them to you. If you start favoriting information that you respect but disagree with, you're going to get more of that. And so will your friends and family. Algorithms represent that opportunity by giving us that power and we should be using it productively to deliberately seek out information we agree with, to deliberately seek out good information, to get involved in conversations where we can respectfully disagree. Now, there will be people who don't so respectfully disagree. I know that. I recognize that this is a hard challenge and that we might be confronted with trolls. That said, I remain convinced that there are more people who want good information, who want to be upstanding and help each other out than there are trolls. So if we all do this, 
we can make the movement that we need to make sure there is good science information out there. The last step is an educational one, making sure we have the literacy to interpret that information. That can be scientific literacy. How does science actually happen? So we need to communicate it better. We need to communicate it earlier. We need to start helping people understand what science is and how fun it is. We're all scientists. I have a three-year-old. He's the best scientist I know. He's always asking questions. He's always trying to figure out why and what for. He's always testing gravity. It usually works. We need to cultivate that at an early age. At the same time, we need to combine that with media and news literacy. Why do media organizations make the types of decisions that they do? What are the economic pressures that can lead them to disseminate good information or bad information? How do we fit into that process? And how do we sometimes get in their way by not giving them a fair shake, by seeing them reporting on the other side and thinking, oh, they're super biased, instead of thinking that's part of their job and it's part of my job to engage with that. I agree fun wholeheartedly that we need to return to productive disagreement. And these are all ways we can do that. Social media makes that easy. We all have hundreds of friends. They aren't all just like us. If we engage with them, we can make a space where more of us are talking across party lines and hopefully at least understanding the other side, even if we don't always agree with them. So don't just leave science communication to the scientists. We need to do better and we hope we will, but that includes you as well. We all need to do better. We need to help translate, we need to help share, we need to help correct. We need to ensure that science communication is relevant to each and every one of us. Thank you. Um, while you're thinking of your questions, I'm gonna kick it off. The process of science, of course, is a process of falsification, of change in conclusions, of testing conclusions. That's progress. And scientists themselves have been critical of their own science. You know, is this science replicable? Is this science reproducible? So how do we avoid having people look at the real process, the real self-criticism of good science, mm -hmm. and going, forget it. I don't trust any of this science. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll take a first stab at this. Um, it, it, there was an effort, and, and this was during one of the last Congresses, uh, House Science Committee mandated that the National Science Foundation uh, put together uh, or, or charge the, the National Academies to put together a committee on, on replicability and reproducibility to look at exactly that problem, meaning where are we in science, what does the process look like, and do some of the, what some, have pe some people have called self-correcting processes that are in place, and what some people have called a crisis, uh, replication crisis, how has that influenced or could that influence um, um, public trust? And I, I think there's a few important things, and one goes back to what Emily was saying, uh, we do have fairly low levels of epistemic knowledge about science in, among the U.S. public, so very few people, or, or at least a sizable chunks of the public, don't know what an experiment, a, a random trial looks like, random control trial looks like. They don't know what the elements are of a scientific study, so they wouldn't be able to tell a good study from a bad study if they had to. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's already a real problem in that kind of literacy, I totally agree with Emily, is, is, is important to build. Um, on the other hand, and, and this is something that we spoke to in the replicability report for the academies, um, there's a bit of a, a tricky part built in. We don't want perfect replication. If, if we replicate every study we do, science has come to a, to a standstill. We no longer push the boundaries of what's knowable. Right? So uh, if you think about chemotherapy right now, it's an imperfect method for treating cancer. We're basically poisoning the body hoping that the cancer dies before we do. I mean, that's a simplistic understanding of chemotherapy, but, but that, I hope we all agree that this is not the best way of treating cancer but it's the best we have at the moment. So we're gonna push forward n into new frontiers. Sometimes it's gonna work out and sometimes it's not gonna work out. So the key question is how much of that, of that error rate do we wanna have and how do we communicate that that, that self-correcting and proving ourselves wrong um, is actually a large part of science being healthy. The question is, I think, especially since you mentioned the replication crisis, where the degree is. Uh, how much of that is too much and how much of that is too little and where do we hit that right? Um, but we do not want science that replicates all the time. That actually would mean that we've come to a standstill. Well, is part of our message that 
scientific, the scientific process and what it produces is a different type of knowledge than other kinds of knowledge. And it warrants regard and trust because of that process? So I, and, and it's an interesting one, uh, an interesting, I, I, I've been asked that question many times and I've talked to a lot of people about this and I, I, I think the, the, the I, I'm very reluctant to make a, a, a relative statement about a better way of knowing, which very often mm -hmm. is used, um, that it's, it's our best way of knowing and, and I'm not sure that's true. Um, I think it's a way of accumulating and, and systematically categorizing information uh, that is superior to most other tools that we have for that particular task, meaning categorizing and, and, and systematically working through information. Um, but we also know from lots of studies, um, uh, including Brian Wynn's now famous study of, of what happened in the aftermath of the Chernobyl disaster in, in, in the UK, um, that sometimes indigenous knowledge and, and, and knowledge of, of, of various communities, including farmers, was way superior to what, what, what government scientists produced at the time. So I, I think, and this sounds like a very academic evasive answer, but, but I think it's, it's, it, the, the, the tricky part that we have is that we, we, we work in a very systematic way of, of knowing and of building knowledge, and, and I would argue that's the best way that society have, has for, for this particular task. That also constrains us in the kinds of statements that we can make, right? And the kind of absolutist or relative statements that we can make or have to make. Uh, and that's, I think, creates a, a unique science communication challenge that we're getting better at. I totally agree. Um, but I think there's still work to be done. Emily, did you want to add? Well, and I think that it is a delicate balance, right? Because we're all scientists. We want to value scientific expertise. So how do you make it something that is both valued and recognized as an expertise that not everyone has, while making it something that everyone can participate in. Mm -hmm. And I do think, again, making it clear that science is not just for scientists, that we are all doing science on a daily basis in our own ways, helps, helps engage in that conversation. Mm -hmm. So starting it much earlier and, and making the parts of science that are easily understood, understood, even if I don't know much about chemotherapy, I understand the process that they're going through and thus can have more trust in it. Yeah. Do we have a question over here? Uh, I'm JT. I'm a mathematician, but uh, my background is also in a field that is probably the most infamous for the knowledge deficit approach, which is computer science. I'm pretty sure everyone here has at some point thought the IT guy was being a little annoying and condescending. Um, but sort of one of the big things that's pushed me to take more of an interest in policy and such is that in that field in particular, and sort of in general, we saw it with climate change, you know, 60 years ago. You talk a lot about like, well, this is what we have to do when the science is controversial, but what if the science suggests there should be a controversy, but there is no public discourse? Mm -hmm. I, I think you mentioned one of a number of scenarios, right? Because sometimes there's controversy and there shouldn't be. Um, sometimes there is no controversy and there shouldn't be, and sometimes there's no, uh, there's no controversy, but as you say, it, it, there probably should be. Um, or at least there should be a broader discussion. Um, and, uh, and, and I think we saw a little bit of that in the early days of, of nanotechnology when, when some people felt that, um, especially things like multi-walled carbon nanotubes, uh, maybe sharing the same characteristics or some of the same characteristics as asbestos fibers. Uh, we were putting them already in car paints. Mercedes, for example, was putting them in car paints. So if you sand that off, you're basically inhaling, that was the concern, some of the same particles. So again, this car is going to be 15 years old. Somebody repaints it at some point down in the product life cycle. Um, and, 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 and we actually wrote a piece at the time where we compared scientists' attitudes and risk perceptions to public attitudes and risk perceptions. And we showed that in the area of environmental health and safety, scientists had higher concerns than the general public, which typically doesn't happen, right? They're typically more optimistic about the benefits of the technology and, and also more optimistic about the ability to, to manage risks. In that case, it was different. And, and, um, and some people like Andrew Maynard and others who was still at the Wilson Center at the time, was now at Arizona State, um, spoke very publicly um, as a scientist to the need for more public debate about this and actually taking the science public to have this conversation. Um, I think the second um, example, and this is a, a current one, and, and I think the National Academies did a really good job there, was when, 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 when the first um, global summit on human genome editing, CRISPR, uh, happened in DC, in the, in, the, in the lead up to that, there were some discussions that we needed another Asilomar, so another conference that would parallel what we had done for recombinant DNA, bringing together people in a, in a somewhat confined space. You will know much more about this than I do, um, but, but with somewhat limited public input at the time. Right? 
And, um, and I think for the, for the global summit, um, um, I don't know how many years later, I can't do the math right now, um, but decades later, the idea was let's do this public. Let's, let's have the public part of this uh, patient groups um, who spoke very much like you just did on the microphone to scientists, to ethicists on the stage. Um, so I think that's another one where the scientific community said we need to have a public debate early on um, before some of the first um, 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 applications um, take place. I, I had um, said at the time I'd give an interview to Mashable for all places uh, talking about, about uh, human genome editing. I said by the time the first HIV resistant babies are born, this is going to be too late. And I did not know this was coming four, four months later. Um, and of course, it, it happened um, four months later. And, um, and, and, and that was not foresight, that was luck. Um, but, or, or, or maybe the misfortune, but it indicated why we need to have exactly what you're describing. Sometimes we need to take a debate public, not because it's going to be controversial not to manage public opinion, but because it warrants that broader negotiation of values that I hopefully talked about earlier. Is that the stage we're at, you think, with AI, Inclu especially kind of deep learning and fast evolving AI, that we need more public understanding and debate? Absolutely, yeah, and, and, and Emily will, will be able to speak to this as well. But I, I'll just, I, I think the best indicator is um, that, that DeepMind has hired somebody who, do, who does public engagement for them. They routinely have, uh, so DeepMind is, the, is, is Alphabet's or Google's AI arm, basically a research arm, what they describe as the Manhattan Project of AI for them. Maybe not the best parallel, but yeah. Um, <laughs> The, uh, and, and, and they do on the top floor of their London buildings, they routinely do community engagement and bring people in, they talk through applications that they're working on and so on. So if, if, if the research arm does it and thinks it's urgent, um, I think it's a pretty good indicator that, that uh, I think for AI, it's, it's, it's the, the, the implications are gonna be on so many different levels and into so many different areas of life um, that, uh, that, uh, that it's probably the, the perfect example for that. Did you want to add? But I think that also speaks to your earlier point that we need to take science communication to where people are. Mm -hmm. People are really busy. It would be fantastic. And I love having debates about AI and things like that. That's why it's part of my job. If it weren't, I don't know that I'd have yeah. the time to. And so trying to figure out ways that we can make it more accessible and something that they can pick up, something they can have a conversation over the water cooler about rather than having to invite them in all the time, trying to think of ways to reach people where they are. Well, you mentioned the Manhattan Project, but part of the AI debate, as you know, is autonomous weapon systems. So it's not such a crazy analogy. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I didn't, I didn't question the content accuracy. I was questioning the science <laughs> communication <laughs> wisdom behind it. Um, yeah. <laughs> you Do you have a question? Hi, uh, yeah. uh, I'm Harish, a graduate student in the chemical engineering department. And my question was more about a piece of data that you presented earlier, showing that if people know that they have to discuss uh, whatever they're looking at with people with potentially opposing views, they tend to give it thought from both sides. But I've noticed that in some cases, even with me, um, I tend to dig in to my point of view already, even when there's opposing information presented. So is there some, was there something in the study that either prevented that from happening, or uh, are there any methods that you think of that could yep. Yeah, so, so really quickly, um, to your point about, about backfire effects or, or, or uh, boomerang effects, as they sometimes are called, uh, there was at some point a, 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 an early, a study early on that Brandon Nyhan, when he was still at Dartmouth, did on, um, in, it was published in Pediatrics, where he looked at interventions for parents that were reluctant to vaccinate their children, uh, and basically gave them a bunch of corrective conditions, none of which made much of a difference, except for the, the factual CDC information corrective condition. And what they found in that study um, is that, that people who were in the factual corrective condition actually did exactly what you described. They dug in even further. They did worse than the control group. So in other words, if I hadn't talked to them and told them all the facts, why they're making the wrong choice, they would have been more likely to vaccinate their children than they didn't. That study, um, some people tried to replicate it, didn't replicate as well. Um, and, and Brandon is right now writing a piece for uh, a special issue of PNAS summarizing all that work on boomerang effects. So it's real, absolutely. And I just wanted to give that context. You're absolutely right. Um, I think one of the things that, that may be happening here um, is that this is that what we're looking at, we were looking at is only the preparation for, we didn't look at necessarily attitudinal outcomes, right? We're only looking at where do they go. It's a very behavioral outcome. Where do they spend time? Where in that gated information environment do they spend time? 
they may still, I don't, I don't know from this particular piece of data, if they're going to walk away with more polarized views. They may still do that, and this is partly what the NSF project is all about, the, 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 the three-year grant to figure that out. Uh, but you're absolutely right. The next question is exactly that, or the, the, the next answer that we need is exactly that. Do they, have, do they look at the other side, and, and because you can use it in two ways, right? One is to actually understand the problem in its entirety, or as sometimes we, in, in, in communication, we call it interpersonal utility and uses in gratifications research, to use it as ammunition. So I'm basically trying to get your ar arguments to have better counter arguments. Um, and that would democratically probably less, less than ideal. But so absolutely good point, um, really important um, phenomenon. And you actually can get people to be motivated by accuracy rather than mm -hmm. motivation, if you will. So sometimes you can give economic incentives. Sometimes it's as simple as reminding people or asking people that, hey, it's really important to, to come to a more accurate position not just to support your own viewpoint. So I think we can do more to help make people aware of those biases so that they can hopefully combat them. Thank you. Uh, next question. Hi, uh, I'm Eduardo. I'm a PhD candidate and I'm a UX scientist. Uh, one of my questions was, what is the feasibility of uh, conducting research in science communication that looks at search en engine uh, behavioral mm -hmm. and how they search for science uh, uh, terminology and also like design, which is what I focus on uh, creating persuasive choice architectures and uh -huh. information architectures that not only increase engagement or I guess what you would call more time on those websites um, uh -huh. to be a sort of more applied in the science communication and create more operational validity. Um. I, I, I know very little. Um, I think there's a lot of effort to build that right now. There's going to be a meeting next, in mid-February, I'm going to say, in, in Washington, D.C., um, from the Division of Earth and Life Studies, ironically, at the academies, bringing together uh, Google, Facebook, um, and then scholars like David Lazar and others working in the space, um, figuring out what is the infrastructure um, that we would need to, to promote more of that research. I think there's pockets, and a lot of it is in more in political calm, I think, and, and others of people trying to, to sort those things out. I think there's, there's very little, um, there are very little systematic efforts. There's also a second element to that, and there will be two short papers presented at that meeting uh, making an argument for uh, a public use data set. Um, and so basically saying, how do we build some of those data sets? Because some of the most important data, so for instance, how am I being exposed to viewpoints that are different from my own, how does scientific information spread through social media platforms? A lot of that happens behind password protected platform, or parts of the platform. So I can't actually study it. I also can't study it in a way that's replicable, ironically. Mm -hmm. And we spoke to that in the replication report. So how do we build um, um, uh, some of the infrastructures? There's an interesting model for that. It's called Social Science One at Harvard that Gary King heads. Um, that's beginning to do some of those. But I think building the coalition is the next step there. And I think uh, that meeting, it, I, I, I keep, don't know if it's going to be streamed, but I think that's going to be an interesting uh, meeting to, to, to watch mid-February at some point. Not specific to search, there is research suggesting that when you see there's a lot of social cues, when you see that a, a topic is very popular, you're more likely to engage with it even if it disagrees with you. Um, so I do think there's an element of that already built into Google. People don't go to the second page. Some of that's laziness, but some of that's an assumption that the algorithms are working for us. Um, so doing more to make sure we're training the algorithms about what we want to see, I think is something that we can do that's practical right now as we start working on the bigger challenges. There's an online question about an apparent trend of much of the public to actually view experts as less credible than, say, your next door neighbor or your friend on Twitter. So the question is, how does one offer the best science if one's very expertise uh, and the active disrespect devaluing of that expertise makes your message less likely to be received? So I think part of the answer to that is be the friend on Twitter and be the next door neighbor, right? Like be in places where people are. People are always going to trust uh, people they interact with, people that they know more than people that they don't. If they think of experts as remote people off in the ivory tower, I can understand why they would feel not only disenfranchised, but distrustful. Being instead somebody who's on the street talking to people, 
whether that's social media or whether it's in your backyard, I think is part of the solution. Do you turn to you? I'll, I'll add to that two thoughts. One is um, um, the, the assumption that, that the public doesn't trust science or trust science less than it used to is empirically actually not true. Um, if you look at the science engineering indi indicators that have tracked uh, trust in institutions since the 60s, you'll see that, that science is second most trusted just behind the military. And the military um, it really went ahead of science in 9-11 and then just never gave up their, their lead. Um, but beyond that, media have gone down, pre press has gone down, Congress has gone down, the White House has gone down. Uh, the, the science has actually stayed pretty stable and has uh, actually increased a little bit in the last couple of years in, in the most recent data. Um, but number two is I, I do think, and this is to, to Emily's point also, you know, be the neighbor and, and be that person. Uh, this goes back a little bit also to what I said earlier. If, if we virtue signal that our values are different mm -hmm. from the values that, that are brought to us with concerns, I think it's a really hard sell to say you should believe me, but not the, the person. You know, we've seen that even the Pope, right, where my values align. Even that, even he has a hard time selling science. But if I go out and as a scientist and I say, look, I mean, you're a deeply religious person, but religion is really not scientific. I don't know what you're talking about. I can't be surprised that I'm not having a conversation where my viewpoint gets across. Uh, Susan Fisk at, at Princeton has done really interesting work on, 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 on how we see credibility. Um, as a function of competence and warmth, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and, and so uh, and scientists do really well on the competence part, but we don't do very well on the warmth uh, and some of the developmental psych stuff uh, that even among children that shows that children will believe a, a nice non-expert over a non-nice expert um, when it comes to you know, even naming things and so on. Um, just highlight that. Uh, sometimes warmth goes a long way. Um, I think that the, on the competence uh, 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 dimension, we don't have a problem. And if you want to be that neighbor and that person on, on, on social media, um, starting out by saying, my values don't align with yours, very often it's just not the way to do it. And, 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 but it, it's something that, that you know, some of our most prominent communicators have done and continue to do. Yeah. Question. Hi, I'm Taylor Seinke from the Shattuck St. Mary's Bioscience Program, and I was just wondering what you guys thought about uh, controversial topics that were polarized and having a discussion with someone who's very closed-minded. In terms of how to reach them? Yes. Great question. Because it can happen at the dinner table, mm -hmm. it can happen in the classroom, mm -hmm. and it can happen in the public square. I, I, I'm going to come back to something that I just said, and I, I, I do agree it's a really good question, and I think um, uh, you know, the fact that everybody is, is, doesn't have a really good answer means it is a really good question. Um, but I think a part of it, and we know this from communication, right? that, that um, I, I talk a lot about values and aligning, but, but basically the, the, a lot of the, the uh, when I showed that graph in the end and I basically showed the three different models, I think a lot of them were so the first two models at least assume that science knows what we should be talking about and what the big issues are. Um, um, Sheila Jasanoff, who is a, who is a historian of science at, at Harvard, and, and Chris Saha and Ben Hrobot at Wisconsin and Arizona State, wrote a piece about CRISPR where they said, we as scientists don't even know what the questions are that we should be asking. Even if all of us in this room, I'm assuming most of us have some scientific background or interest, came up, tried to come up with all the, the important questions we should be asking, we wouldn't be able to because there's others and there's, uh, when I, I give you one example, when we talk to, to, to disabled communities on the Human Genome Editing Committee for the academies, some of those communities told us, we don't want to be fixed by you. We, you know, so as you're looking for cures, hard of hearing communities, we don't want you to fix it. There's nothing wrong with us. So in order to have a meaningful conversation, I think the very first step is to listen. And the very first step is actually to say, where are you coming from? And then the second step is to, to resist my urge to say that is not a valid concern, right? Which, and I happen to be a person who has zero religious bone in my body. I just, I just that's not an, an infrastructure or a cognitive infrastructure I have. But I fully understand how somebody approaches human genome editing from a religious perspective and says this questions very deeply held values that I have. And for, for me to say that's not a valid concern is, is, is just strategically stupid and I think frankly um, um, you know, questionable from an academic perspective as well. But so I think the, the listening part and then to communicate to the concerns and the values that people really bring is going to be a key thing. And again, that takes us, and this is why I had that third model, it takes us out of what science normally does. Science basically says we're taking all the human elements out and we're, we're focusing on facts. 
Um, but a lot of these issues that create controversy for climate, it's a good example. There's less controversy about climate change being real. And I think Emily said this very powerfully. You know, those, those attitudes are shifting. Um, but what are, what's not shifting, how that challenges what, what that means to be, should we all not drive big cars anymore? Should we all drive little European vehicles, right? And, and of course, you can already see how that doesn't go over well, um, or, or for CRISPR or for whatever else. So I think, that, so I think those would be kind of some of the, some of the steps, um, um, be less of a scientist. You know, Emily, uh, there's a question online that kind of dovetails with this, which is, how do you engage with people online? when it's someone who's just diametrically opposed to your point of view. And the questioner also asks, what if you know that there are trolls waiting, trolls lurking, funded trolls? Yep. That scary environment. Yep. And I am sitting in a position, a privileged position, where I have some protection from that. But at the same time, it is scary. And I think. I would echo exactly what Dietram was saying, is start by listening and start by understanding where the real concerns lie. So people don't get the flu vaccine. Why not? Well, a recent study suggested it's about needle sensitivity. For a lot of people, they, they are deathly afraid of needles. And so because they are so afraid of needles, they don't want to get anywhere near one. And so to resolve what we call the cognitive dissonance, this is good for me, but I'm not getting it, they start thinking, well, this is bad for me. So if we can address that concern, then we can start moving the needle <laughs> for a, a very terrible <laughs> pun um, <laughs> on that issue. So I think the same is true on social media. So there's a couple points to make. One, again, it's about the community seeing the interaction. It's not always about the person that you're engaging with or the troll that you're engaging with. They might not be persuadable, they not, might not be even engaging with you in good faith. And so you don't have to convince them. It's everyone else who's seeing that interaction. And two, if you get in a situation like that, you can. this is not like a mandate to do this at the cost of your own sanity or safety. If you're in a position where there's a lot of trolls coming at you, you can disengage from that conversation. It's not every time you see it, you have to do something. But I think if slowly all of us start kind of taking proactive steps to make sure the information we're seeing is good, there's more of us than there are of them. Great. Question over here. Hello, I'm Joshua. I'm a master's student at the Hubbard School. And I think my question builds off of the previous two questions in the sense that I, I wanted to get your thoughts on if I imagine a situation where there's this ongoing discussion, let's say, between uh, a committee of scientific experts who hold one view, and they're looking to get some input from a portion of the general public on which steps they should take, uh, whether it's for a specific research project or some type of emerging biotechnology, for example. Um, and let's say the two sides have opposing viewpoints. To what extent do you think each side should accommodate the viewpoints of the other side? Because I think of a, if we take it to its logical extent, if we say we need to have these engaged discussions, then what's the ultimate outcome? I, I think you put your finger on a, on a really important question. Um, um, Vicki Colvin, when she was still at, at Rice, uh, a toxicologist, um, she, she at some point was on a panel just like this and, and was asked a similar question. And she's like, well, if you're not willing to close your lab, then don't call it engagement. Um, and so uh, you know, as far as resolving some of those conflicts, uh, if you really hear from the public um, that you shouldn't, uh, in your scenario, you didn't talk about the public. You talked about a subgroup of the public and a highly engaged one. I think this is where the key question is. Um, uh, what, what will happen in a lot of engagement exercises is that you get um, the tail ends of the normal curve. You get people who are highly interested in the topic and really want to push this forward, say a patient group, and you get a group that's really opposed for various reasons, and you don't get a vast majority of the public who are, for reasons that Emily outlined earlier, I mean, they have other stuff to do. They have lots of other issues every single day, are not engaged. And so, so to which degree should we act on, 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 on highly polarized opinions? Uh, and I think there's t the answer is twofold. One is we want to have those conversations upstream early on in, in, the, in, 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 the, in the in the research life cycle where we where we hear from affected and engaged communities. Even there, very often we need to be very careful if those are the communities we want to talk to. I'll mention CRISPR as one example. One of the most promising potential applications is sickle cell, which affects certain populations uh, much more than others. Many of the populations that are affected by sickle cell traditionally don't engage with the medical community all that much for either historical reasons or socioeconomic reasons. Um, and so even that is tricky. But I think more generally, and we spoke to this in the genome editing report, in the human genome editing report, 
if we really want to talk about public engagement, we need to implement tools that, that talk to the population at large and that give equal opportunity for all parts of the population. Um, and right now, for instance, the public feedback processes in the, in the RAC, in the recombinant DNA advisory committee, or whatever the new one is called, it's better, but it's not ideal, right? And so I think, I think we, we just don't have a lot of those mechanisms for broad engagement in place, which is why I think right now we're seeing so many investments in that area and in more research um, um, in that area. But I think it's, it, it, it's a, uh, you're putting your, your, your finger on, on, on an important problem and one that a lot of people have been struggling with. Next rack. That's what the that's, is that new what it's called? Yeah, yeah. Next rack, yeah, exactly. Let, uh, in the interest of time, let's get both of these questions, and then you all can respond. My name is uh, David Hunter. I'm a professor emeritus in the Department of Radiology in the medical school. I had uh, one question quickly about medicine and communicating. And I and many others that I know in the medical school never get on social media because of its risk. If anyone ever took in a piece of medical advice that you gave and something happened to them, your career is finished. Uh, and so we just don't discuss medical things. And I would ask you if you think that any medical discussions that happen about medical problems, including things like anemia uh, that affects black populations, whether or not these should always happen with medical groups as their originator rather than individual practitioners. And practitioners, if therefore you, you feel they should stay away from mm -hmm. public media, which is the practice most of us take. Mm -hmm. The other question that I had very interestingly about people communicating science is that one of the difficulties with any of us communicating science to people are things like the Mayo uh, study, I think it was out of the Mayo Clinic, looking at publications in the New England Journal of Medicine, finding that something, and I forget what the exact figure was, like 50% of the articles in that journal over the course of a year or two were refutational. In other words, they were disproving something that had been published before. And I think that it would be interesting to see what you think about it, if there were some way to quantify how fast any particular discipline is actually changing its mind. And that this should become part of the dialogue with the community, because I think generally the community ignores us because of the fact we're always changing our mind. OK, let's get the last question in, and then you can respond. So my question is, I could have as much knowledge as a professional in context, but compared to a grown up, people would not believe me because I'm a kid. So how would I look convincing or even sound convincing to a community that would rather believe a grown up rather than a teenager? Two great questions from a medical perspective and a high school perspective. I, and, and there's maybe an interesting tie-in together around social media. I'm, I'm especially coming, just having come back from from Europe. Uh, I think Greta Thunberg is a really good, good example uh, of somebody who is who is. And it doesn't matter where you stand on 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 you know the particular things that she's pushing, um, but but it was used. I think at, at, at an existing media infrastructure, both traditional and but certainly social, very successfully. Uh, uh, to, to do a few things. A, put an issue on the agenda that traditionally hasn't been on the agenda as much as it has, climate change, even in the US. Um, how did you do that? Well, certainly through social media, um, mobilizing, not, actually not trying to convince a bunch of old people, 35 plus, um, to, do, to believe what she wanted them to believe, but by mobilizing people just like her who ended up taking off Fridays every day from school in European schools all over the place. And all of a sudden, this became actually a news story that even for adults, grown-ups, older people, was an interesting story. because, it, And it was in all the newspapers and all the traditional legacy outlets because there's all these students not going to school anymore. So she basically, what we call in communication, agenda, she built the agenda. Right? So why did an issue appear that typically journalists wouldn't put in the agenda? Um, so I think there's actually mechanisms um, and, and to, to really change uh, what we as a society talk about. And I think this is also a little bit to the, to the, to the, the first question. Um, I do appreciate the idea that you know, concrete medical advice over social media is just a fundamentally bad idea. 
Um, but at the same time, there are, I think, medical questions that are, that are really about, for example, uh, it, and I showed you the example of voting. Right? The idea that a lot of people go vote and that your neighbors do something, that contagion effects has been shown again and again to, to mobilize action. So the same thing is true for, for getting people getting vaccines or people doing other um, uh, health relevant, be engaging in other health relevant behaviors. So I think there's lots of, 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 of opportunities there. I think the last thing that I'll mention is, is also, I don't think we have a choice. Um, that when I ask in my class how many people have a subscription to anything that is not Spotify, um, there no hand goes up. There is no subscription model in the future for news outlets. Um, it will be an algorithmically, economically driven model. Social media, and, and they may not be called social media anymore, they may just be that, um, are going to be the new normal. So I think we need to figure out how to, how to, how to use them effectively. And then the very last thing I'll say on the, on the question about um, um, uh, uh, replication rates or, or falsification rates, uh, which I think in the medical community, they're, uh, they're a little bit ahead because you do want, you, you don't want to have a file drawer problem. So this idea that null effects end up in a file drawer and are never published because a, 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 a treatment working in one out of 100 cases, but 99% of the cases it doesn't work, doesn't really help you as a community. Right? It, it, it's ineffective. Um, I think for other, and this is a, a discussion in social psychology, mm -hmm. to a less degree in our discipline, but the, the father or problem is a much bigger problem. That interesting stuff gets published because it has an unexpected result, and the and the null findings end up in a file drawer. Uh, the report spoke to this quite quite. Uh, the replicability report of the academy spoke to this quite strongly. So I totally agree with you. And I, I don't know where I'm looking. Actually, I can't. Remember. Oh, there you are. Um, the, uh, uh, the I, I think I think you guys may be a little bit ahead of everybody else, um, and and everybody else is just catching up. But but getting at, at quantifying those rates and actually showing how quickly some of those self corrections work, um, I think we'll be uh, getting a long ways toward Susan's point from earlier about public trust and, and how we communicate that. And I wanted to echo a lot of what you said there. I think social media gives you that opportunity to demonstrate competence and warmth, right? You can demonstrate that you have the knowledge, even if it's not coming with a PhD or an MD or whatever it is after your name, um, that there's all kinds of expertise that we're willing to value. And you can also demonstrate that you care about people's communities. And I don't think you need to be a grown up to do that. And I think that also applies to the question of definitely don't give like medical advice. You should do this about your mole on Twitter. Um, but there's a lot of things that you can do that help build up that reservoir of credibility that you can draw upon um, that people can, can use. So whether it's retweeting the CDC or, or the AMA or, or pointing people in those directions, making sure that knowing you should get your flu shot, which you should, um, making sure that that's really prominent is an important thing. Our next talk in this lecture series is from Inside the Media Beast. Laura Helmuth. Dr. Helmuth is the health and science editor at the Washington Post. She's going to come here, join us Friday, April 3rd in this room. Registration's already open. We invite you and those online to join us. Please join me now in thanking our great speakers. Thank you so much.